Those of you who are inclined to get a bit emotional should have your handkerchiefs at the ready as I want us to think for a few moments about tears. What makes you cry? What sorts of books or films reduce you to helpless floods of emotion? How often have you wept from a sense of loss or hopelessness, a sense of frustration or self-pity? When did you last cry and why? We are not given much information from the Gospels about Jesus' emotions. It is only recorded twice that he wept. Once, as we have just heard, for the death of his friend Lazarus, and once, in St Luke's Gospel, as he looked across from Bethany to the city of Jerusalem, We are told, however, that he thought crying is all right. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh in St. Luke. Or in St. Matthew's version, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. From this, it would seem that being able to cry is a normal part of being a Christian. No surprises there, I would hope. Being able to cry is a normal part of being human. And to be a Christian is, amongst other things, the business of trying to be fully and properly human. Although one can, perhaps can be forgiven for sometimes thinking otherwise. But when is it appropriate to cry? Tears can be hard things to evaluate as their association with crocodiles, spilt milk and babies can show. What sort of tears are blessed? The tears we shed over a favourite Betty Davis movie. It's nice to have a good cry sometimes. The self-pitying tears we shed when depression leads us to build up a pitiable impression of ourselves. Does God put these tears in his bottle? In the psalmist's curious phrase. Is this genuine emotion? Is it real? The word emotion means being moved out of ourselves towards something or someone. A so real emotion involves being moved by a situation out there which our mind confirms to be truly worth our tears. This is why Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, not because of any romantic attachment that he might have to the city, but because he can see all too clearly its ignorance, its stupidity, its helplessness, and thus its doom. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem not because he knows that it will be knocked down, although the city was indeed eventually to be destroyed, but because the people in it are all too vulnerably human and they do not see the things that make for peace or the activity of God right under their noses. 
So Jesus weeps for Jerusalem for what it has become. But he weeps also because of what it could be. When we cry over a particular situation, it is not only because of what is now, but also because of the stark contrast with what we sense ought to be. Thus we find in our experience that the blessing on those who weep must be linked with the blessing on those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We weep over the present, but we also hunger and thirst for a situation when our sorrow will be turned to joy, when helplessness and death and destruction are overcome and humanity is fully restored in righteousness. So in St. Luke's Gospel, Jesus weeps over a city, Jerusalem. By contrast, in the fourth Gospel, St. John's Gospel, he weeps over a person, his friend, Lazarus. And this time, he is not alone in his tears. He is joined by the dead man's sisters, Mary and Martha. More years ago than I care to remember, I was a student, briefly, in a delightful city, Chichester, 70 miles or so southwest of here, near the coast of West Sussex. One of the perks of living there was that I could drop into the cathedral whenever I wished and feast on all the wonderful modern art dotted around the place. Since the time of the remarkable Dean Walter Hussey, who died in 1985, Chichester Cathedral acquired a reputation for commissioning great modern art from great modern artists for use in a sacred space, a great contrast to the rather dull pastiche that was all too often the order of the day. Consequently, in a medieval cathedral, we now have the work of people like John Piper, Graham Sutherland, Mark Chagall, Hans Feibusch, and more is being commissioned as I speak in 2011. These are wonderful works of art, but in many ways for me, they are eclipsed by some of the oldest parts of Chichester Cathedral. Walking eastwards down the South Choir Isle, one's attention is drawn to two stone panels, carvings, probably taken from an altarpiece dating from the early 12th century. One of these depicts Christ arriving at Bethany and being greeted by Mary and Martha. The other depicts the raising of Lazarus. These are remarkable examples of Romanesque sculpture in so many ways, not least because they are so well preserved. And they have moved more modern sculptors also. The influence of them on the work of Eric Gill is unmistakable if one looks at his Stations of the Cross in Westminster Cathedral. Indeed, he once told a close friend, I have seen these stones many times, but never without tears. The great 20th century sculptor Henry Moore records the first time that he saw them standing before them for a considerable time in amazement and rapture. 
He later recorded that they were just what I wanted to emulate in sculpture. Now, I am not normally moved by sculpture, but the power of these two panels in Chichester is undeniable. And whenever I hear the story of the raising of Lazarus, the 11th chapter of St. John's Gospel, words you heard earlier, whenever I hear that story read, they seem to return to my mind's eye. I have been pondering why this might be so, and I find myself falling back again on the words of Henry Moore. He says this, in the Chichester sculptures there is deep human feeling. I think the sense of suffering and tragedy is chiefly given through the heads. Look particularly at the head of Christ in the raising of Lazarus. The eyebrows and the eyes are steeply sloped downwards from the centre line of the face, expressing intense grief. And in the mourning heads of Martha and Mary, there is the same tragic feeling. I think that is the most extraordinary thing about these sculptures. They are lamentations in stone, carved grief. They are incredibly moving. They catch perfectly this part of the story of the raising of Lazarus. The intense grief that pervades the story until the moment when Lazarus comes forth from the tomb. Martha weeps. Mary weeps. And so does Jesus. There we have it. The shortest verse in the Bible. Edra krusen ho Jesus in the Greek. Jesus wept. He does not weep as the women do. The Greek verb used by St. John is different, less intense, but he weeps nonetheless. What is going on here? Is it the author's intention to heighten the climax of the story, the raising of the dead man? Almost certainly. St. John's Gospel has been plausibly described as a book of signs, a series of pointers as to who Jesus is, pushing us forward to the sign of signs, the cross. And the story of the raising of Lazarus is the strongest hint, as it were, of what lies ahead at Calvary. Are these tears not just a reaction to what has happened, Lazarus is dead, but at also what might be? Martha confesses a faith of sorts in some kind of life after death, and both she and Mary rebu rebuke Jesus. If only he had got there in time, then things might have turned out differently. Both Martha and Mary have a faith of sorts. Ill-formed, stumbling, possibly incoherent. They have a faith that things need not be that way, that something different could happen. And to see more clearly, they need to change their ideas about who Jesus is. The author of St. John's Gospel seems to want us to change our ideas. He assumes that we too already 
have a faith of sorts. Ill-formed, stumbling, possibly incoherent. But he wants us to move on. He knows that faith is something that we grow into, not something that is given in its fullness at the beginning. And so St. John records instances in his Gospel that illustrate this, and he identifies us, at least a little, with the characters he describes. This evening, we are offered Mary and Martha, the sisters of the dead Lazarus. They have faith. They rebuke Jesus for his delay, but they know too that he can still perhaps do something for their dead brother. They express the popular belief of the Pharisees that Lazarus will rise at the general resurrection at the end of the world. What they do not yet realize is that, that Jesus is the one to bring the life of the resurrection into the present, of which Lazarus is to be the sign. Martha thinks she believes, but she is mistaken. Only after Lazarus is raised up, does she begin to see. I suppose what's one of the great, great themes of St. John's Gospel, you think you believe, but you are wrong. You are mistaken, because there is always more to what you think you believe than meets the eye. Amen. And I suppose if we were to take that seriously, then the religious fundamentalist might be delivered from the desire to equate what he or she believes with the fullness of what can be believed or said. And all of us might be challenged all, always to be on the lookout for new dimensions to his or her faith. I think it was the great 20th century theologian Karl Rahner who said somewhere that God is that being who is always slightly greater than the being we thought of yesterday. Visible in Jesus, yes, but just beyond our reach. This is unsettling stuff if we take it seriously. But then, of course, no one anywhere said that faith was meant to be easy. And if by any chance anybody did, it would be a lie. And the truth, so I read somewhere, will make you free. And among other things, your tears will indeed be turned to joy.